play. In this presentation, I'm going to derive Fick's law of molecular diffusion by considering simply the random motion of particles in one dimension. And I'm then going to use that to show how in a random process, you tend to get a net movement that is zero, that's sort of maybe obvious, but there is a typical deviation from the mean, a root mean squared movement that scales as the square root of time. And that's quite important for any random process. So in order to do this, what I'm going to do is start as I normally do with a completely blank sheet of paper. Okay, and then what I'm going to show here is this arrow. That's simply the flow direction. It's, uh, we're going to consider movement, not necessarily just from left to right. It can be from right to left. It's a random process, but that, that indicates the X direction. So I'm going to consider things in one dimension. And then I'm going to draw these uh, two boxes. What they represent is a small volume of the porous medium. And I'm simply representing them in the X direction, and they're just going to have a width delta X. They're going to have some cross-sectional area A. And then within that volume of the porous medium, they're going to be some particles. And this collection of particles I represent with this blue blob. And then in the next door box, um, there can also be some particles. Here, this will be a different number of particles, so that's uh, represented by it being lower down. So in this particular example, there are fewer particles in the right-hand box. And these particles move at random. And what I mean by that is that every time delta t, the particles can make a hop either to the right or to the left. And that will be of a distance delta x. So it will go into the next box. And that's true of the other particles. So that's um, the, the situation that we have. Just to make that um, explicit, this location is the x location. The box itself has a width delta x. So this is that. So this represents n for the number of particles at location x minus delta x over 2. And this is the location at x plus delta x over 2. Okay, so n okay, is the number of particles. Right. Write it all out. Now, we're also going to consider a concentration, right? Because we normally write fixed law in terms of concentration. C. C in these particular exercises, I'm going to assume is a mass per unit fluid volume. So my concentration, therefore, is going to be m, which is the mass of a single particle, times the number of particles divided by the fluid volume. And because we're in a porous medium, we have a porosity phi, because not all the volume is full of fluid. I'm going to assume this box has a cross-sectional area A, and that's going to uh, cancel out, and it has a length x. So now I can find a relationship actually between n and c that's going to be useful later. So n is then going to be phi a delta x divided by m times c. So n and c are linearly related, which uh, should be obvious. Okay, now we actually get to uh, Fick's law. Now Fick's law says that, okay, we have particles moving at random, but there is in fact a net flux. What do I mean by that? So my flux, right, flux, which I give the symbol F, is a mass that moves per unit area of my porous medium per unit time. So what I'm going to do here is my flux then, okay, is going to be a mass. It's obviously going to be proportional to the mass of each particle. And I'm going to do it per unit area. And I'm going to assume that there is a time step delta t. But what happens here? Here I have some collection of particles. In a time t, half 
move to the left, half move to the right. I'm going to consider the flux at location x. What I mean is how many particles are moving across this barrier? Well, half of this number, but then half of this number moves in the other direction. So the net flux is half of this minus half of that, well, then with the appropriate units that I've shown there, multiply by the mass of each particle divided by area per unit time. So in fact, because the concentration is higher here than here, even though it's a random process, each particle moves left or right randomly, there is a net movement of particles across this boundary. So at X, there is a net movement from high to low. Okay, so let's just do that mathematically. So the flux is, it's gonna be a half because there's a left or right movement, N of X minus delta X, two, minus n of x plus delta x over 2. Okay. okay, fair enough. Now, I'm going to take the limit that delta x goes to 0, and I'm going to find a derivative. So just to make that very clear, dn by dx, right, if we think about it in calculus notation, would actually be this minus that, wouldn't it? The n of x plus delta x over 2 minus n of x minus delta x over 2, and this would all be divided by delta x. So in the limit that delta x goes to zero, so we're considering small hops, okay, um, small region of course, medium, we can write here that the flux okay, is m over 2a delta t, this is going to be a dn by dx, but you notice it's a minus dn by dx, and also there's a delta x to it. <laughs> but now we want to write it in terms of concentration, because that's in fact how we write Fick's law in terms of concentration. So if we look here in terms of concentration, our flux, okay, is a minus dc by dx, okay, that's fine. What do we got here? Well, for n, we're going to multiply by phi a delta x. The a is going to cancel out, the m is going to cancel out. We've got a phi term here, another delta x term, and the two delta t. So we've got a phi, okay, a delta x squared over two, T. And if we look at Fick's law of diffusion, is normally written for a porous medium, saw my previous video, is a porosity times a molecular diffusion coefficient times a dc by dx. And so this is the same mathematical form with a molecular diffusion coefficient, as you can see here, that is simply your delta x squared over 2 delta t. So that's fixed law diffusion, essentially in, in more or less one line. Okay? Um, if you were to do the derivation in three dimensions, and you assume this delta x is the same, it's just the hop size, um, you would find, because the particles can now move up, down, sideways, or the other way, there's a one in six chance of every movement, and so this two turns into a six here. Okay, so the diffusion coefficient, um, you can redefine it. Um, but in one dimension, that's fine. So we have a molecular diffusion coefficient, it's delta x squared over two delta t. There is this porosity term that comes out simply in the definition of concentration because we're, we're dealing um, with a porous medium. Okay, so that's interesting in itself. But what does that really mean? How are the particles actually going to move? Because on average, they're not going anywhere, but there's this net flux. What does that lead to? Well, it leads to obviously a smearing of concentration gradients. You know, if there's a high concentration gradient, the particles move randomly and smear that out, as, as we know. But what does it mean a little bit more mathematically in the, in the way in which things move? So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to remove some of this mathematics um, because we're not going to use it anymore. And I'm just actually going to look at the movement of particles. 
particles. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to consider that our particles are making a number of hops. So they're making a series of hops. And I'm going to see how, um, what that implies in terms of the movement. Okay, so. <laughs> I can keep everything out there. I'll keep my diffusion coefficient because I'm going to need that a little bit later. Okay, but I get rid of all the all the other things. Okay, so now what we're going to consider is a case where we have we've done n hops, right, and we have a time t, and that's going to be n times delta t. Okay. And we have a location xn. Now let's consider that we take the next hop, okay? And so we're at xn plus one. Now these hops, right, of size delta x, and we can move left or right. So the next one can either be xn plus delta x, or it can be xn minus delta x. On average, because there's a 50 50 chance of it being one. The average value of xn plus one, right, on average, because it's 50 50, is simply the same as it was before. Because on average, you haven't moved, because half go to the left, half go to the right. Okay. But now, what I'm going to consider is I'm going to consider xn plus one squared. So here, this will be 50% chance of it being here. So I'm going to square that, 50% chance of it being here. Square that. The average value of this is going to be 50% chance that it's moved um, to the right. So it's going to be the average value of x n plus delta x squared, plus a 50% chance that it's moved to the left. So it's at a minus delta x squared. Okay, and we can you know, forget about all of that. Okay, so what does that give us? Well, here there's an xn squared, there there's an xn squared, but they're both multiplied by a half. So I get, yeah, I get an average value of xn squared. Now let's look at this term. There's a delta x squared here and another plus delta x squared here for two halves. And the average value of delta x is delta x, right? Delta x is a, is a fixed number. I don't have to sort of want to say average. Now let's look at these terms. The cross terms is two delta x, xn, and then here minus. So these cancel out the cross terms. That's all I'm left with. So let's look at this. The average location, the average movement is basically zero. So if we imagine a case where the very first I started at the origin, so to begin with, it was zero, then I can say that the average distance that I move is zero, because every time I move equally left or right. Okay, so on average, I haven't moved. But not as clear as that. So imagine drunks coming out of the pub, right? And they're just randomly taking a step to the left or the right. If you look at them half an hour later, they're slumped somewhere, right at the pub door? Maybe not. They've gone some typical distance, right? Randomly, of course. Similarly with tossing a coin. If I toss a coin 100 times, i quite surprised if I had exactly 50 heads and 50 tails. It will be about that, but it wouldn't be exactly that average. Well, that's a bit vague. It wouldn't be exactly that average. And actually, we can be a bit more clear about this because the average value of x squared, okay, from the mean, sorry, the roots, from the mean here, so the, uh, let's uh, raise that. So the average value of x squared right, is not zero, but is in fact n times the number of hops. So it's, it's the number of hops times delta x squared. So the average deviation is zero, but there's a typical root mean squared deviation that goes with the number of hops times delta x squared. And then we know that n is t divided by delta t. So we can write this as delta x squared over delta t times t. 
And then we have conveniently down here, that delta x squared over delta t is 2 dm. It's actually 2 d t. So the root mean squared movement, okay? And uh, this is quite an important um, thing to, to point out. So the root mean squared movement here is the x squared times the square root. So the root mean squared displacement is therefore 2 dm t. So if we're considering, for instance, tossing a coin, and we toss a coin 100 times, on average it's 50 tails, 50 heads, but what's the typical deviation? Is it between 80 and 20 heads? No, it's about the square root of the number of times you toss the coin. It's plus or minus 10, roughly speaking. So here, that's what we're seeing here, is the root mean squared displacement goes as the square root of time, right, or the square root of the number of pops. And that's very significant. So molecular diffusion on average doesn't move you anywhere, but there's a smearing out that goes as root dt, or actually precisely in uh, one direction, the square root of 2 dt. Okay. So that's um, what I wanted to say um, about a random process. This is really quite important um, that, that we have a random process like this, and this is the behavior uh, that we see. I just wanted to say one last thing about this. Is traditionally, what you, how you might approach it is you've got fixed law, which is a nice partial differential equation, or at least it's got a C um, dx term in it. You put it into a conservation equation. Actually doing that is called fixed second law, as though somehow conservation of mass is a new uh, discovery. Um, and then you'd solve that with lots of nice mathematics. And somewhere in that mathematics would be a root t. But in fact, you can show directly that the typical deviation from the average from a random process scales as the square root of time or the square root of the number of trials or hops. And you don't need a partial differential equation to do that. You do it actually just directly by uh, considering uh, the statistics of those hops. So very important concept, because if we have an advective process, something where you're going with the flow, you move at a typical speed. And so how far you move scales linearly with time. If you have a random process, then it goes as the square root of time. In a porous medium, we have both processes occurring. And so what happens if you imagine you're in a reference frame going with the flow, you still have the random motion imposed on top. So you actually add the two things together, a linear motion plus this random one combined. Okay, so I'll finish there. Thank you very much.